for the for the and I thank you for the invitation, uh, which is as usual a kind of a, a challenge to say come and talk about Portuguese geology uh, to a group of people here here in Cork and and the surroundings. So it's difficult for me, obviously, to talk to an audience I don't know exactly uh, who. We, who you are and uh, what kind of audience it is. So uh, I tried my best to find uh, uh, a place, a correct place to show things that I, I hope will be interesting for, for you. Um, I, I tried as much as possible to find um, similarities or um, connections between uh, Ireland and um, and uh, and Portugal in terms of of geology, and um, to to start, um, I think um, it's important to show that geology, although the countries are very uh, very far away from each other, geology can have interesting relationships between the countries. Uh, we all know uh, the classical picture of uh, Lisbon or, or Cork and uh, not only the, the cities are different but also the landscape is different, the sheep are different, uh, the rocks are different but everywhere we can find sheep and rocks and houses so uh, we can think and talk and uh, uh, try to find interesting things uh, uh, about it. I, I will use uh, always this red star for Portugal and this green star for Ireland to kind of locate you uh, in terms of uh, geography and mainly paleogeography because things were not as they are today when we look at the geological past hundreds of million years ago. So this is the outline of, of my talk. I will begin with the basics of Irish geology seen from very far away because it that's the story that most of us are somehow familiar with then uh, i will talk about the portuguese uh, geology and trying to show always connections or relations or things that are uh, in some way similar in both places and in part three uh, which i called here and there i will show some examples from the Carboniferous, from the Jurassic, from the Quaternary, where the Irish geology and the Portuguese geology have things to compare, not that they are the same, but to, to compare. So I will take kind of 15 minutes uh, uh, with each part and uh, at the end we may talk a little bit uh, about it. So starting with a million years ago, uh, Northern Ireland was here, Southeastern Ireland was here. There was a big continent called uh, Gondwana, uh, Equator. So we, you were in a very different, uh, completely different place in the world. Nowadays you are here, but you were in the Southern Hemisphere. And besides that, Northern Ireland and Southeastern Ireland were apart, separated by a big ocean, which is this Iapetus uh, Ocean. If we advance a little bit in, in, in time, uh, that ocean uh, was closed, so Ireland became a kind of Iberian Peninsula, so here is Portugal. So Ireland and Portugal was quite close to each other on the southern hemisphere, which is quite surprising, but they still had an ocean between, between them, which is this rake. Uh, 400 million years ago, that ocean, that uh, rake and the Apetus ocean closed and it brought, and that was surprising for me, brought very much side by side Ireland and Portugal. I didn't invent this map, it's just like that. So 400 million years ago, uh, if I went to the Portuguese seashore uh, or coast, I could see the Irish seashore or coast side by side with, uh, with me. So the closure of this uh, 
of this ocean, this Yapetus ocean, uh, gave origin to a kind of sutur, a collision zone, uh, which I'm trying, which is uh, in Ireland is represented by all this uh, area here with the, the red uh, arrow. So this is the collision zone, the closure of the Yapetus, which crosses Ireland and new, it goes to Newfoundland here and you will find it also in Portugal. That's another similarity. So in the Carboniferous, um, there was some uh, marine environment invading uh, both uh, Ireland and Portugal here from, from the north. It was not in the Atlantic Ocean, it was the Paleothetis coming, coming in this direction. No, notice that meanwhile, Ireland and Portugal they are drifting northwards. By then, they were about the equator, equator here. So things are changing. We go, both countries go side by side and go. Are uh, making um, a trip to the north, but the limestones, carbonates in Ireland and also in, in Portugal because we had tropical waters. And um, 330 uh, million years ago, the, this, all this geodynamic instability, all the continents uh, or the previous continents colliding to each other, giving place to this large, mythic, supercontinent Pangea. It created a great uh, instability, geodynamic instability, and uh, turbidites and deltaic deposits accumulated here in um, southern uh, Ireland. These are the typical um, carboniferous turbidites you can see in the Mohair cliffs and also in, in Portugal. But this this collision, this Pangea, uh, is called the Variscan orogeny. So the continents collided to e each other. And you have all this collision arc, this collision zone, which affects Southern Ireland, England, but also Portugal and Spain. You have here the direction of the deformation, the folding, the mountains. So this is a kind of great mountain chain, like it is today the, the Alps or uh, the, the Himalayas, if you want. So these, these lines in blue, they represent a mountain chain in the late Carboniferous, 300 million years ago. And these mountain chains went from here to, from Portugal to Ireland, England and Germany. This was a mountain chain connecting our both countries and going then to Central Europe. So this is the situation. You see the, the latitude now, it's about maybe 15 or 20 degrees north. We have this big continent, this big uh, Pangea where Portugal and Ireland was were really close to each other. I will go for now. We when when we think about the Irish uh, geology, uh, when we go from the Paleozoic, from the Carboniferous and Permian to the Mesozoic, to the Jurassic, around 200 or 108 million years ago, the continent, the supercontinent, starts to be invaded by this ocean coming from here, which is the Tethys uh, Ocean. And at the same time, the North Atlantic is trying to open here. You see, this is the African plate, the South American plate. This is the South Atlantic, which did not exist by then. This is the Central Atlantic, and this is the North Atlantic, which was just beginning to open. And that opening of the Atlantic affected both Ireland and Portugal. So the Mesozoic geological 
history of Ireland and Portugal is quite similar. They are both here looking uh, at the Atlantic, which would open here, and looking to the Tethys, which is on this side. This opening led to the um, formation of several uh, basins, sedimentary basins, uh, which are uh, proliferous in uh, oil uh, reserves. The Rockalstroff, um, North Celtic Sea, sea Basin, the Porcupine Basin, all these are Mesozoic offshore basin related with the opening of the Atlantic. They are under the sea because by then Ireland was kind of uh, a big island. This was land but around Ireland you had a sea and sediments here which accumulated on sedimentary basins and this is the origin of these petroleum basins all around Ireland, uh, the UK and then to the, to the North Sea. Uh, by the late Cretaceous, as you can see, the North Atlantic is quite well defined here. Uh, Portugal and Ireland continue to go northwards. I remind you that they began to be here. 400 million years ago they were here, then they were here, and now they are going north and north. So, so by the late Cretaceous, we had a real Atlantic here, a real North Atlantic here, and Portugal and Ireland facing the Atlantic and looking at Canada, um, Greenland growing, going westward. So this is the story, the Mesozoic story of the Irish geology. Uh, in tertiary times, so around 60 million years ago or so, the Atlantic, the North Atlantic continued to open. So at this moment, you had to travel maybe three or four thousand kilometers to get to from Lisbon to New York. Today, it's maybe four or five thousand. And you had to cross maybe two thousand kilometers to go from Ireland to uh, Newfoundland or Nova, Nova Scotia. So it, it's opening and it began to open here. And the opening of the North Atlantic was prograding from south to north like um, a zip opening here through Greenland and, uh, and, and so on. So this zip opening, uh, you see here, this is Iberia, this is Ireland, so it opened uh, like, like branches, like a zip to the north with, with one branch going west of Greenland, the other grow, going east of Greenland and this opening of the Atlantic uh, brought volcanic activity to, to Ireland and to also the Iberian Peninsula and in northern Ireland you have the Giants Causeway which we, you all know for sure I forgot to put a, a picture here, a very um, famous of the Giants Causeway. They are of volcanic rocks related with the zip opening of the north. The tertiary in Ireland is uh, almost nothing. Uh, it's some uh, karst field, solution pipe field. So why? Because Ireland by then was a huge uh, island. Uh, it was uh, land, so what can you expect uh, in land to happen? You have a landscape, you have uh, uh, mountains, you have erosion, but you don't have place to accumulate uh, sediments, you don't have basins. So Ireland has no tertiary basins, which in, in Portugal they exist and I will show you why. And to end with the quaternary, so more recent times, what happened in Ireland, mainly glaciations. Uh, high latitudes, uh, I wouldn't say close to North Pole, but for sure closer than, than Portugal. So 
you had all these glaciations affecting Ireland and obviously they didn't affect as much the Portuguese territory as I will talk uh, in the next few minutes. So with these 15 minutes, I conclude my part A about the Irish geology to kind of locate you on the guidelines of the geodynamic evolution of the uh, West European region, after all. It's the North Atlantic, is West Europe, and Ireland and Portugal, actually they share this very important geodynamic, geologic, geographic, and also cultural position. They are Western European Atlantic countries. And that's crucial for everything we can think about our culture, geography, history, that makes us really different from people from Ukraine or from Morocco or from uh, Finland. And, and what I'm saying is partially because of our geological common evolution and position. So what can we say about Portuguese geology, which it's somehow similar or comparable with um, the Irish uh, geology. I, I will take again some of the picture I, I showed you before. So the Rake Ocean separating Ireland from Portugal and the closure of that ocean, it happened also in Portugal. This is in southern Portugal. We have the closure of the ocean. We have the same uh, closure suture, the ophiolite related to, with the subduction and so on. This is more technical stuff, but we also have the, those signs here uh, in, in Portugal. And you, if you see this green line, which is the, the closure, the suture of that ocean, you can see that it comes here, down here. It goes to Nova Scotia, but it comes also here to, to Portugal. So you can find here, similar terrains, geology, Paleozoic deformation, etc., both in Ireland and in southern Portugal. Uh, this is the aspect of the Portuguese Carboniferous Turbidites, and they are contemporaneous, coeval, and very similar, somehow, to the Irish Moher uh, Cliffs. They are the same age, more or less the same environment, and they have the same geological background, and they have been originated in the same kind of environments, although in Portugal more open marine and more deep, and in, in Ireland more coastal, and also in Portugal probably the deformation is much higher, as I will show you later on. Uh, so this is examples of the Carboniferous turbidites in Portugal. Uh, here they are like in Mohair cliffs, but here you see that they are completely uh, folded uh, by the Variscan uh, orogeny. And here is the big Variscan orogen, the folding connecting southern Portugal to southern Ireland, to the Armorican massif in France and to Germany. And the picture of that, the scheme of the sketch of this deformation, you see all the units are um, completely deformed because they have been affected by that uh, late collision with shortenings sometimes. This is, for example, how it was before the deformation. And this is how it is after the deformation. So, Deformation is very, very intense. Um, so the Paleozoic basement in Portugal is covered by uh, Triassic sediments. And the change from one geological era, which is the Paleozoic, to another geological era, which is the Mesozoic, is a kind of a political decision, is an administrative decision to say, okay, until yesterday it was Paleozoic, today it, it starts the Mesozoic, but it's based on geological changes. 
geological change of scenarios. And that really happened uh, when we came from the Permian times in Palazor to the Triassic times. And there is this famous uh, and unconformity, the Sikar point, um, which le led Hutton to start thinking about time scale and the huge dynamic of Earth. This is an unconformity between folded pilo Paleozoic and metamorphosed schists and horizontal or tabular uh, Triassic uh, sandstones. So this is the famous seeker point of Hutton where the geology is born. This is the Portuguese equivalent uh, in southern Portugal, the Portuguese equivalent of Sicar point. Uh, I just imagine if Hutton had seen this, he would be quite amazed by the dimension of this compared with his nice uh, pocket geology Sicar point, which made him think about uh, where did it came from and the huge geological time. This is in C southern Portugal, um, close to Sagres. It's a fantastic unconformity between folded uh, Carboniferous turbidites and horizontal Triassic sandstones. This is the unconformity. You see that these are the, the turbidites. They are folded, almost vertical, and the Triassic almost horizontal. And again, a landscape of that unconformity. What is important here is that these turbidites, they are folded and metamorphosed. And that means that after they have been accumulated in a marine basin in the bottom of the sea, they went down at least five or six kilometers. That means, and I will say it slowly, that on top of these rocks, we may be absolutely sure that once upon a time, there were five or six kilometers of rocks. I mean a mountain. A mountain existed here on top of these sediments. And between 230 million years ago and 200 million years ago, which is the age of these rocks, in this hundred million years, this mountain has been completely destroyed. So in hundred million years ago, I had like 15 million years ago to take these rocks five kilometers down and then another 50 million years to uplift, to bring them up, to completely erode that mountain and to deposit by normal rivers surface rivers, these late Triassic deposits. So this unconformity is a fantastic place to think about the scale and the forces of geology, just as Sikar point, but with a more magnificent exposure, uh, I, I'm sure. So the Mesozoic opening, uh, let's go now to the Mesozoic in Portugal, uh, this is in Triassic times, this is in uh, Cretaceous time. So this is the opening of the ocean. Here is Iberia and Ireland. This zip opening, the Central Atlantic was completely open in Cretaceous time. It was opened here between Portugal and um, uh, Flemish Cap, uh, Newfoundland. It was opening here close to Ireland and it would open more to, to the north. So Ireland has Atlantic basins and Portugal has Atlantic basins. But there is a big difference, which I will show you later on. So the sedimentary infill of these Atlantic basins, in Portugal we can see it, it's not under the sea, and I'll explain you later on why. And it begins with those uh, classical in all Europe, uh, Triassic red beds, the uh, Bundsanstein from the, the, the German. Then you have these uh, clays with evap evaporites, halite, uh, gypsum. It's the Muschelkalk and the Kuiper from the Germans. So as the sea began to enter this, uh, this coast, 
and then a carbonate platform in early, early Jurassic with open marine carbonate ramp, beautiful limestones. This is one hour from Lisbon at uh, Peniche. Uh, the same place, Peniche, here, the lower Jurassic carbonates looking at the, the Atlantic. Then in middle Jurassic, we continue with carbonate platform, carbonates all around. Uh, in some places, those carbonates, they were coastal carbonates and the dinosaurs wander around. And this is um, the prints, the footprints of dinosaurs. And this is one of the bigger uh, footprint, footprint paths of, uh, of the world. It, it's a, it's a, a nether, a, a luck. This is a, a quarry, a huge quarry. And they stopped at this, at this level because it's very hard. Uh, and in this level, those tracks have been discovered here. This is again, one hour north of, of Lisbon. Then in late Jurassic, the basin uh, was filled up and we have more transitional sediments, coastal sediments, transitional sediments with some carbonate, some siliciclastics. All this is one hour from Lisbon. Then in Cretaceous, we continue with transitional environments uh, as we had the oceanic breakup. This is half an hour from Lisbon. We have very good coastal exposure, as you can see, not, not only to go to the beach, although the, the water is quite cold, but to look at the, the cliffs also. And in Nazare, we have this uh, beautiful cliff with late Cretaceous carbonates and the biggest wave in the world, which has been recorded here at uh, Nazare due to this, uh, what's happened at the end of Mesozoic. And that's the explanation why we have this uh, very good uh, exposure. What happened is that with the opening of the Atlantic, South America went this way, Africa that way, and at the end of the Mesozoic, Africa collided with, with Europe. So we went from Atlantic extension, which happened for 100 million years ago, the whole Mesozoic, and we began to have compression, the Alpine, the Alpine uh, compression, which affected all Southern Europe and also Portugal. I will show you very quickly what is the Alpine compression. Here is the Alps, and you see it's a mountain chain, but if you follow, all this is folded, across Turkey here, and it goes down to the Himalayas. So all this is a compressional mountain chain, which comes from the Himalayas, the Pamir in um, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, Alps, Pyrenees, and Portugal and the Atlas mountain chain. So all this is alpine collision. It affected also, oh, sorry, I must take this out. Just wait a second. Is this pop-ups which appear with news and it's sometimes difficult to take it out. Okay, uh, sorry, now I must take it out. So what happened? At the same time that the Iberian Peninsula moved on this direction, also Africa moved on this direction and they, co they collided. This is the collision front the Alps, the Apennines, the Anatolian Plateau, the Caucasus, and it goes on to the Himalayas, the Pyrenees, the Batics, the Atlas. So the Iberian Peninsula was squeezed. And as it was squeezed, it was uplifted. And therefore, all those Atlantic margin basins, on the Atlantic parts, they went 
down to the sea. Here they, but they were slightly subsiding, but here on the coast they have been uplifted. So all the Iberian Peninsula has been uplifted and also part of the basins, which were um, these Atlantic basins, which I was showing you here. So the Atlantic basins in Ireland, they went away, they went down uh, with uh, the Atlantic, but in Portugal, part of them went down with the Atlantic, but part of them here, they have been uplifted and exposed. So being exposed brought them upwards. And the same sediments, the same basin, which are beneath the sea in the western part of the Portuguese coast here. This is the Portuguese coastline. This is a section here. In the Atlantic, they are five or five kilometers down. But as we close to get closer to the coast, they are uplifted. And here we have the mountains where, where you can see these very old limestones. I, so this is a good example. This is uh, half an hour from Lisbon. These are Jurassic marine carbonates, which has been, uh, they have been uplifted over two kilometers. They were getting down with the Atlantic opening, but with the Alpine collision, they have been uplifted and now we can see them, touch them. The same place, so Jurassic limestones, you have them in Ireland, but they are beneath the sea. They are full of oil, you can't see them, but they are somewhere. Here in Portugal, they are out of water and we can see them. I, uh, so another 15 minutes went and now the last 10 minutes is about some details comparing or showing similarities or difference between Irish geology and Portuguese geology. And I will start with Carboniferous. These are probably the most striking uh, aspects that we can compare. I already talked about it. The Mohair Cliffs and the Carboniferous Cliffs in southern or southwestern Portugal. They look quite the same, but in Mohair, everything is tabular, is horizontal, while in Portugal, they are completely folded. The, here they are, they look like horizontal, but here they are vertical. So they are folded like this. This is an aerial view of the same place. Here they look like almost horizontal. It's this side. And this crest here is this crest here. So we have a fold like this, almost 180 degrees. And it goes on and on. And everywhere, as you get closer and closer, these are photos from the southwest coast. You see the folding of these Carboniferous rock as they were uh, almost uh, children uh, plasticine. It, you see here the, how rocks have been um, heated, not melted, but heated, um, and uh, acquired this plasticity which folded hard rocks, these are uh, schists and some quartzites, which are folded like paper or like rubber or plasticine. Now comparing the Jurassic in Ireland and in, in Portugal. Uh, I looked for Jurassic outcrops in Ireland and I only found this one. I'm sure there are, there are a couple of them, but obviously most of the Jurassic rocks in Ireland they are beneath the sea. They are somewhere in the North Atlantic on the Porcupine Basin, Rockall Basin, uh, Celtic uh, Sea Basin. They are beneath, beneath water. But in Portugal, you can look at them. So uh, I found this picture on this site. Can you find dinosaurs in Ireland? And uh, what they say is uh, what I was trying to explain to you, that the Jurassic and the dinosaur uh, footprints and bones, they are somewhere buried 
at the bottom of the sea. They are there, but nobody can find them because they are at the bottom of the sea. And when they outcrop, it's very little and it, it's very, very rare to find some dinosaur uh, evidence in Ireland. Not because they, they were not Jurassic rocks, they existed the same as in Portugal, but they are beneath the sea. And in Portugal, they have been brought to the surface because of the uplift and the alpine collision and compression. So this is the Jurassic in Ireland. It's somewhere over here. This is a seismic section. Here is the sea. This is maybe 500 meters of water. This is maybe one or two kilometers of rock. So if you want to find dinosaurs, you must dig here. You don't have dinosaurs, but you have oil, which is uh, for some things, more useful than dinosaurs. And you have these uh, oil basins and these oil and gas fields all around uh, Ireland. We are trying to find oil in Portuguese offshore, but no, we haven't been lucky so far. And uh, now they decided that we don't need oil anymore. It's a political decision. Probably the, the, the world doesn't need oil anymore. I doubt, but it's a political decision and opinion. So this is the Jurassic in Portugal, as I was showing to you. Uh, you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it, um, you can use it, you can, you can walk around. All these are the Jurassic limestones in Portugal. And they are very, uh, very nice to, to visit, of course. Uh, another uh, place, this is less than one hour north of Lisbon and maybe uh, 20 or 30 kilometers from the Portuguese coast inland. So we have dinosaurs, of course, lots of them. It's uh, probably, not probably, for sure, one of the richest regions in the world uh, for dinosaurs. We have uh, lots of um, endemic species, uh, holotypes, we have a thematic part, part with uh, dinosaurs, uh, the second biggest in, in, in Europe. So it's a dinosaur country and a dinosaur region, particularly this place, uh, Lorignan. Um, to end with Quaternary. Uh, Quaternary in Ireland, as I said, is uh, glaciations, glacial deposits. You have lots of them. For sure, in Portugal, we only have glacial deposits in one mountain, which is almost 2,000 meters high, 1,991. Uh, and we have a glacial valley. Okay, that's fantastic for us. The last glaciation made this glacial valley, and we have a few glacial uh, deposits here. That's all. The main thing in the quaternary of Ireland and, and Portugal relating these two places, and we were talking about it before the session began, and uh, I put it here because Betty said me to, invited me to, to put it, is the, the, the Lisbon earthquake. Uh, it was on the 1st November 1755, All Saints Day, Everyone was at the, in the churches praying and the almighty God launched this huge earthquake, which made people wonder uh, if God was really so mighty or maybe nature was something different. And was, this was a very, very important cultural event in Portugal for this reason, reason I just mentioned. So the epicenter, the epicenter was here, around 300 kilometers south of Lisbon. This is the, the, the epicenter, but it is known as the Lisbon earthquake because Lisbon was the main Portuguese city. And I would say for sure in the 18th century, still one of the main cities in, in Europe. Uh, we had by then, the colonies, we had the Brazil, the gold from Brazil. Portugal was a very rich country by then, and Lisbon was a very rich, important, modern uh, capital city. So it is known as the 
uh, Lisbon earthquake, although it was not mainly in Lisbon. Uh, it was here, this uh, black dot is the, um, the epicenter, and you can see here the isocyst, the line of equal uh, impacts or dis destruction. Uh, 10 here, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. So it propagated through the Pyrenees and also to Morocco. You can see here the, the lines. So this is the this destruction was maximum here in southern Portugal, in Algarve. It completely destroyed all the um, southern Portugal villages. It completely destroyed Lisbon at, and it also changed the face of Lisbon. Lisbon was a medieval city and it was completely rebuilt from scratch, from zero, with an um, orthogonal square uh, urban um, street. Uh, so Lisbon, you know, from today, it's an 18th century Lisbon. You, you can't identify almost nothing of the pre-earthquake uh, city. And this is very important. Uh, it's again a cultural uh, event and for this reason L Lisbon was probably one of the first planned cities in the world or in, in Europe because it was re completely rebuilt from scratch like uh, I would say uh, Washington or Brasilia or cities like that. Uh, now I will show you to, to end with this uh, 45 minutes talk, uh, two very simple examples, one in Portugal, the other in Ireland. Uh, this is a place uh, maybe 60 kilometers north of, of Lisbon on the Portuguese coast. Is, here is Lisbon, here is the epicenter, is the, here is the place I'm showing you here. Uh, you have coastal cliffs, a coastal uh, plateau, and here you have a, a river a kind of embayment in the coast. And here, when I, where I have this 60 meters, there was um, a convent, a monastery, a small monastery uh, at a height, a topographic height of 16 meters above sea level. And it has been completely destroyed and it went down to ruins with the Lisbon earthquake and tsunami. The waves the tsunami waves advanced here through this valley, through this uh, throat here, and destroyed this uh, convent, which was 16 meters above sea level. It means that a 16 meters high wave, tsunami wave, advanced and destroyed this convent here. And this is just a very simple, uh, small example of the destruction, which is known to happen all on the Portuguese coast, on the southern coast, there are many, many, many examples like this. Historical examples of people living there and uh, writing what happened, at what time, uh, the height, the destruction, and so on and so on. Now, we were here and the epicenter is here. If we go to Ireland, there is also uh, the, the signs of this tsunami, which took, uh, I saw a, um, a graph, it took probably two to three hours to prograde from here. It took around one hour or less to Lisbon, two or three hours to, uh, to get to, to Ireland, but there were, there were no mobile phones by then, so we had no opportunity to, to launch the, 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 the alert. And there is a small bay here close to, to, to Cork, and I found this, uh, this site, this study, and this uh, very nice video showing that also on this very small bay, there was a huge tsunami and the wave crossed this small isthmus and coincidence or not, the heights that have been reported on this, on this, uh, on this video, uh, again, they are around 15 to 20 meters. So the tsunami took maybe two or three hours to get there, but the height of the tsunami, and that's incredible, 
kept being around 15 meters. So you can imagine that all around Europe, uh, obviously Ireland was facing south, but I would say that here and here and in many places also in, in Morocco, it was a worldwide tsunami uh, and not only a Portuguese uh, earthquake. So with this Portuguese and Irish example, I would finish my presentation and I will be more than happy to talk with you or to answer some questions you may have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nuno.